here with Dan Maxson at the Fairport Lighthouse. He just gave us a tour, and I have a couple of questions for him that I'm going to ask. And uh, what made you decide to be a tour guide for the Fairport Lighthouse and for Fairport in general? Um, like a lot of people, uh, I've driven down to the beach many, many times during my teaching career at Euclid, and I stopped by one day in 1994 or so, paid my admission, climbed the tower just like you did, kind of listened to Mr. Fedak, who lived down on E Street, tell all the stories, and I thought this would be nice to kind of volunteer here in the summer in between, you know, teaching years. And it took about two years before they called and said that they needed some help. Yeah, I'm sort of like a bad penny. I've been here ever since. Now you, you've been here for 26 years, right? 26 years. This is year 26. Uh, started off doing little things and became a tour guide, historian, and everything else. But currently a trustee. So if you had to take a guess on how much money boaters from Lake Erie during the summer and people who come in off rates, how much money do you think, if you had to take a guess, how much money do you think Fairport would make? makes in the summer times when there's all these boaters out here and just with having a cool site in the light. Well, in the time that I've been here, I mean, we're open Wednesdays, Saturdays, Sundays, and all holidays. Uh, you know, one o'clock to four. Sometimes, you know, we have extended hours for special events like Mardi Gras. In a normal season, we get about just under 5,000 visitors. Our peak at been in the early 2000s about 8,000. So, you know, I would say we could probably go five to maybe 7,500 visitors a year, maybe boosted by 30, 40 percent in a given season. And that just helps with the whole community because you have people coming to visit here and then they see the creamery. And in general, this is just a good place for fair. Yeah, it, it's been very nice. Uh, over the years, I, I've tried very hard. Uh, you know, I get bus tours coming in from other states, uh, from New York, from Indiana and stuff. I always try to kind of partner. I've partnered uh, in past years with the family restaurant. The last two to three years, our, our biggest partner has been the Creamery. And Karen and, and those people, we try to you know, get the people to stop here for either snacks or for a lunch and kind of make a day out of it. Maybe they'll come here, have a tour, go down to the beach for a while, or go over to Brennan's or something of that nature. So like I said, it makes it a, a a destination, but the important thing is Fairport's a hidden gem. Yeah. I mean, people just don't realize what's here and the beach access that we have in Lake Access, so it's great. So, uh, do you know what the longest running boat through the port is? Like, that has been coming through here for the longest time? Um, well, our, because of the 30-foot draft in the channel, uh, we can have 600 to 700 foot uh, freighters. Anything bigger, uh, wouldn't be able to turn in the turning basin or would run aground. Um, probably the most steady boat to kind of come in besides Cleveland Cliffs yeah. uh, locally has been the Frontenac. Okay. okay. The Frontenac comes in pretty much almost weekly from Canada, bringing salt back to Ontario and to the Buffalo area. And like I said, it's very important for the Canadians to have a freighter on the Great Lakes. And its, it's history is tied to Fairport's history. Yeah. So. Last question. So you said you have a, you would say anywhere between 5,000 and 7,500 guests. Mm -hmm. How many tours do you think in your whole lifetime, if you had to give us a random estimate, how many tours do you think you've done? Uh, the normal season, I'm here every Wednesday, all through the season. I probably do about 10 to 12 special events a year, and probably about 40 requested tours in a year. So I'd probably say around 1,100. That's a lot. Yeah, that would be a kind of a quick number, quick math. All right, thank you, Dan. All right, nice. thank you. Come and visit. Yep. Or. And see over here behind the clock, the people in the beginning, curators, were the Mitchells. So these are the people that kind of got things started, and Pam was the last person. So the curator through 1991 lived upstairs, okay, so this, where the gentleman is, those are bedrooms, you'll see the kitchen, there's a bathroom, and then this area here, and of course then they had to do tours, they had to open the lighthouse for people, that's why there's the door downstairs, the locks, so like this is your private residence, and you do everything else. So that was in 1991, and then after that, it was no longer necessary, there was enough volunteers and other people 
And so then we just kind of, you know, live nearby and come and open up. Okay? So she is the last person to live here. She's the person to kind of give legs to the ghost cat story. Some of you have seen the ghost cat downstairs. Mm -hmm. It's on YouTube. It's on all kinds of things. Okay? Uh, basically, she talked about the cat running across here at night. There's video of it going like across where the staircase is there. And the gist of the story, the, the short version of the story is this. When the Babcocks came here in 1871, two of their children were born here. Robbie dies at age five of smallpox, kind of the disease of the day. Okay, He is said to haunt the tower at night. So, you know, when you climb through that hatch, people talk about at night feeling someone blowing on the back of their neck or hearing voices saying, go away. Okay. Now, Mrs. Babcock was kind of sad when her, husband, or when her son died, and she was up here kind of despondent. Her husband thought if he got her a cat, maybe it would perk her up like a pet. And it did. Eventually she felt better and got perked up. Years later, when she dies of, as an old lady, the day that she died, the cat disappeared. And the cat lived in the, in the kitchen down there where the fire extinguisher is. So when you live, you'll see where the fire extinguisher is. Now, you would think that would be the end of the story. Well, in 2000, this is like 1900, right? In 2000, when they were putting in air conditioning here, the contractor from Fairport was working on the floorboards, putting in the pipes, PVC pipes and everything, and he ran into the mummified remains of that cat. Now, you know what the legend is, right? Part of the story is true. Part of the story, you got to kind of take it face value. We have pictures of the cat. We have our journal entries. We know the cat was here. Now, is that exactly the same cat? Who knows? Because after that cat, she had 21 other cats. So that cat, if you look at it, matches the picture downstairs, has the same fur on the back side, and is in pretty, you know, pretty good shape for being over 100 years old, right? Okay, so what did we talk about today? Underground Railroad. Talked about Mormons. Talked about LaSalle. Do people come to see any of those stories? Would you come and see any of those stories? Most of you? No. All of a sudden Channel 8 comes and says, hey, there's a ghost cat at Fairport's Museum. And they did that on Halloween in 2000. Next thing you know, people are coming to see this cat. Mm -hmm. All these kids come. Now the kids have to come, which means someone has to drive them. Grandparents. Right? The cat's making us money. People are coming to see the cat. They can care less about the Underground Railroad, right? That's old people. Old people come to see those stories. You guys are coming to see the cat and they climb the tower. Now, what happens in the year 2000, roughly? We're still five years away from Facebook. Market crash. No, what happens around 2000? We're just starting to get technology, right? Phones, right. things like this. Okay, so social media is starting. First group that comes out here is Discovery Channel. It's on television all the time. Look on the Discovery Channel, it says Haunted Lighthouses. It's an hour special. We're the last 20 minutes of it. Talks about our lighthouse. Okay? 2003, a new station formed, Animal Planet. In year two of Animal Planet, it was the fourth most popular episode. Ghost cats around the United States. Okay? Eventually, A&E Biography has been here. Travel Channel, Discovery. All the cable stations have been here. This cat downstairs has six cable shows. Okay, Channel 3 has been here, Channel 5 has been here, Channel 19, Channel 8, New Day Cleveland, Natalie Herbeck and the Moss Man. Kenny Crumpton has been here, my years here. Okay, people are coming to see this cat. Okay, Friday night, I have Friday night lights. People come at 8 o'clock on Friday night to see the cat. I'm going to climb the tower too, but mostly the cat. So the cat has become a celebrity. Okay, he's on YouTube. He's got like thousands and thousands upon hits. People watching him. Okay, all right. So that's the ghost cat story. All right, in that room here, the one bedroom. This is my archives. Okay, so when you walk in here, you're going to see all kinds of things that are important. Okay. Here's all the Coast Guard history, all the way into the 1800s. Look at that, Coast Guard history. 
Okay? Here's Great Lakes Carriers. Over there on that shelf, Great Lakes Carriers. Those are all the ship's logs. If you had a relative on a boat in 1920, I could probably find the page in that boat. What the manifest was, what the ships had on it, names of the crew. Okay, so this is great for archives. Okay, you can see we have all kinds of other things. Over here behind your videographer, up until 2010, 2011, we have every Fairport yearbook. So you guys started going digital. Now we, they don't give us any stuff anymore. Okay, so if you could get us any stuff, keep us moving forward, we have everything. People come and say, where was Euclid Ray Stereo? What happened here in 1935? We have the yearbooks. I know all the people, all the businesses. Okay, see? These are called archival boxes. These are like newspaper articles, things of that nature. So you can kind of see we have all kinds of things there. So this room is kind of our library. Okay? I just got a grant. And I have to go meet for the grant next week, but we're going to get, we've got a grant to help us start to digitize everything. Because one of our problems is, almost all, I'm the youngest member, one of the youngest members at age 66. So most of the people are like 75 to 80, so technology is not like inherent. Therefore, and scanning and doing things is like a big task. It's not something that they want to embrace. Okay, so you can kind of see, in a thing like this, we know where everything is. It's all archived. But let's say you were interested in all the post offices in Fairport. See, we have a folder with all the post offices, all like seven locations where it's been in the village. The Diamond, the railroads, okay, Coast Guard, here's all the churches. See, so now it winds up being taking a folder like this, and see, here's all the pictures are archived, and here's all the black and whites going all the way back into like 1890s, 1900s, things like that. And now scanning them and getting them cataloged and things like that, correct? Okay, so we've gotten a grant to kind of help us with that. So that's here and there. On this side, there's all kinds of newspaper clippings and articles. So, I mean, literally, we're, there's probably at least 40,000 pieces of paper and photographs, of which we have maybe 2,000 scanned and done at this point. So we've got a grant, they're gonna come and help us for about six months and try to train more of us to keep this project moving forward. See, and then you get things, people donate things. Like here's the pharmacy, Cov grows. See, so their family's giving us a picture of their dad. <laughs> they wanted to sell us the original cash register, but we only accept donations. But yeah, you know, so we have things like that here. So you kind of see all of that. And here's probably the one thing that is probably the coolest thing, and you can see, see, I mean, here's like Fairport street scenes, okay, Fairport residence, okay, the historical sites. See, so I mean, we have all kinds of photos, books, things like that to still archive. I mean, this is like a never-ending process. So would you say you're looking for some high school students to maybe volunteer? Um, we've Maybe. had them in the past. Um, her name was Caitlin Dickerson. She oh, was like okay. a bowler. Yep. And there was another girl, her name was Allison, I forgot her last name. But her grandmother was uh, Kathy Miller. And she was on the volleyball team. And they used to come on Wednesdays and help Eleanor Zabo do clippings and cut. And sometimes they would come and even do sometimes like even just like Windex. Right. And clean some of the archival shelves and stuff. Okay. Hey. So yes, we've had people in the past come and do that. That's cool. um, so, so we can kind of show you some things here. This is probably the most famous thing we have. And I don't have white gloves on, which is this is the original deed, day one of Fairport, 1812, notarized. You can see the seal down there. This is when Fairport in Lake County was still part of Jaga County, signed by Henrik Payne, who eventually that's the Paynesville family name. So look at this. This is day one of Fairport. You can see we have every house. You can see we have the village green, the whole thing set up. Here's the names of all the original people. And it's on parchment. So that's really that's kind of cool. cool. 
And then we have all kinds of other things in here too. Some of you have noticed downstairs too. Like I have the original ways that the uh, Grand River ran. See, then we have like all the original roads. So you can see downstairs, like I have 1904 up on the wall. So anyone that lived in Fairport in 1904, there's your house, who lived in the house, whatever. You know, so like Vance Todd is a librarian and he lives over across from the square. I mean, I know the whole history of his house. Who's lived there before him, all the people that lived in his house, things like that. So I mean, people want to know family histories. So that's just all in here. And you can see we just keep acquiring things. These things have to still be cataloged. Nice. So that's kind of, you know, what we do over here. And so I know you guys got to watch your time now, so and we have a picture of it. And if we have any history of it, it's on the back or where to find it. And then our last, our last spot is over here. There's every Fairport newspaper for decades. <laughs> wow. See? Going all the way back in the 1940s. <laughs> Fairport newspapers. So I don't know, if you were born in Fairport on January 3rd, 1958, I have a paper <laughs> to prove you were born. <laughs> wow. So this is John Ola's closet. I don't know what he has in his closet. <laughs> but then you have other things in here too. Like this, this is the merchants, all the Fairport businesses, so here's 1933, and here's the merchants catalog. Your teacher probably remembers like the old days of Montgomery Ward catalogs and things. But I mean, look at that, so you have the meat market on 7th Street, and all the businesses in Fairport. Wow. So that's kind of cool. You have all that kind of stuff. Hat. They set it on sideways and twist it. Now it's locked in. So this is your face port right here, and they'd open it up. That's how they would talk to you, right here, and uh, give you a shot of water, drink of water, whatever you needed. And then once you were ready to go down, they would close it, tighten it down, and then now you're in there with no air, right? This is your spit cock right here. 